Well, good morning again, and uh, another great, beautiful day the Lord has blessed us with. I want to let you know I'm honored and privileged to be here today to be able to bring the word to you. Uh, looking forward to uh, what we're going to talk about today. It's been a tough book for me most of my life in the Bible since I've been reading. It's a place where I've heard a lot of different uh, opinions and different stories and some things I'm going to tell you today I don't know, but some things I've heard, and uh, but mostly I'm going to tell you what the Word says. And I just uh, hope as we go through this together that you'll get what you need out of it, and God can use it to uh, bring glory to Him through the message today, and I pray that it uh, might help you a little bit in the way you see things, because uh, Book of Job is a tough book, and it really seems like something that... Uh, don't seem fair, don't seem right, but uh, and I've, many person I've talked to in my lifetime about it has sort of said that and expressed that to me, but anyway, I happen to be reading the New Testament through each month, the uh, majority of it, and now I'm uh, backed up during that. I've tried to add a little to it, so I've been reading the book of uh, Nehemiah, and I read Esther, and now I'm in Job, so that's where this came from. Uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day and the opportunity to be here at uh, Voice of Truth to speak your word. I pray for each and every one that is uh, tuned in that gets to listen to this today. Pray as we uh, share this message, Lord, that you'll just uh, be lifted up, Lord, and you'll help us to see you clearly for who you are. And Lord, more than anything, let us see ourselves for who we are. And Lord, apart from you, we're nothing. And we just love you and thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, today I, I'm, I'm going to talk about some things going on in the world today toward the end, but today I'm just going to jump right into it, and I just want to start off by, you know, I've heard that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. For me, I couldn't answer that. I don't really have a clue. I don't know a lot about the timing of a lot of different books. I know the order they end through the Bible. But as far as history and studying that, I haven't done that, but I've heard it from some people that are knowledgeable that do a lot of studying on things like that, and they say it's the oldest book in the Bible, so... That started hitting on me when I was reading it this time. I'd never thought about it before, but if it's the oldest book in the Bible, it really uh, means that God sees it's mighty important to be the first thing he put out there. But I know that for me, that when I started studying the Bible, I read Genesis. And it clarifies right in the beginning, it tells us how God created. We didn't create, God created. And it tells us everything was formless, how uh, the, the, everything was, uh, the water was everywhere and darkness was everywhere. And the Spirit of the Lord, Lord roamed over the earth or over the, the airs. And God said, let there be light. And it was. So we see that everything started and how it became in the book of Genesis. God said, let it be, and it became. Became is a very big word in the Bible. It says that anything that was a certain way to be changed had to become, or you became. It even said Jesus became. But if you're born again, you became. If you're not born again, you're still the same. <clears throat> the word became is a necessity for a believer. You have become what God wanted you to be. You know, if Job was left out of the book and wasn't in the Bible, I believe he'd still come to faith. I believe any one book left out of the Bible, you could still come to faith. But all books were, were written by God for the Bible. The Bible is one big book, one consecutive story that explains everything God wants us to know. So when you've got any issue in your life, Job's here for you. Jeremiah's here for you. Corinthians is here for you. John's here for you. Luke's here for you. Thessalonians is for you. Revelation is for you. Every book in this Bible is written for a reason and a purpose to give you clarification in your life so you can understand where God's trying to take you. The Bible does not ever stand on one book alone. I know in the book of Revelation it says if you add or take anything away from this book, it would be a bad day for you. But if Job's the first book written, why would it be important to write something this drastic, this horrifying, this 
hard to understand this unbelievable circumstance of God because I've read this to a friend of mine before one morning in a motel and I remember reading it to him and I remember his answer was I don't want a God that wants to sit up there and just use me as a pawn and torture me and make me kill me or whatever take away what I have work for and things like that you know and I'm sitting there thinking Phew, I didn't see it that way but I understand how you see it that way the book of Job is a hard book You know, uh, all through Scripture, you can see where God allowed a lot of things to happen to righteous people, a lot of terrible things, a lot of hard things, a lot of suffering, a lot of pain. But you remember those stories a lot better when you see what somebody went through to let you see how God works and who God is and how much faith they had and how God got them through the situation every time. The Bible says God will never give you more than you can handle. I think in life sometimes we blame God for something maybe he didn't give us. Maybe sometimes we take on more we can chew. But I'm telling you right now, if God's in it, he'll carry it through and he'll finish it. Even though you might have a hard time through it sometimes. This story of Job on faith is a necessity, is necessary for you. It's where you need to see when you're trying to grow in Christ and become what sanctification Terry spoke on last week, and I, it was a wonderful sermon. And I'm telling you right now, the Bible says we all need to be sanctified. And I'm telling you right now, Job was sanctified. The very first thing that God clearly shows us the kind of man we need to be. In the book of Job. It starts off by saying there was a, the land of us that lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright, feared God and shunned evil. Listen to me now. He was blameless and upright, feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned so many sheep, so many cattle, so many herds of this. He owned wealth. It says that he was the greatest man among all the people of the east. The greatest of all the people. So God really had his hand on him. And he knew it. That's when God was blessing him so much because he knew how to use it. He was helping others. He was being an example for people to live by. He was just doing all the things God wanted him to. There's no worry you'll find anything in the book of Job about Job not listening to God. And it says even, even in this book, it says his sons used to hold a, a feast. They used to have big gatherings and eat together with all the sisters and friends. and all, you know, They just have a big party all the time. They invited the sisters over to eat and drink and just have a big time. And it's, it's just, it was a common thing for them to do, it seemed like to me. And it says Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking perhaps my, my children have sinned and cursed their God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. You know, when I, when I read that, it shows me that uh, Job was blessed with a family, wealth, resources, and he was the greatest man of the East. But he knew his tr children struggled with some things, and he was worried about his children maybe not doing what God wanted to do in some days. So he prayed. He prayed in advance for them. He would pray for them all the time. And he would make sure that he was putting a prayer up for him. And we're going to see at the end of this story here the power of somebody's prayer. But we're going to also see how far prayer can go for you. You know, but it, it was a, it, for early, he rose early, it said, and went and prayed, you know, got everything ready for him and prayed for him. So he started his day off sometimes with God in the morning, but he was praying for his kids a lot of time because he knew his life. But he wasn't sure how, what they did the night before or when they had parties or whatever. But and the story gets down to where we really get involved in it big time. In verse 6, it said, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. So it shows that the angels came to present themselves or to get their orders or to find out what God wanted them to do for the day, and Satan came too. I don't think Satan maybe wasn't invited, but Satan has access to go back to the throne to talk to God. We see that clearly here. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan said, to and fro the earth. So now we see that Satan is roaming the earth, 
and why is he roaming the earth? To see what devastation he can do and things against God. So God knows he's down here doing what he thinks is destroying God, and God knows he's down there doing what he allows him to do so he can strengthen God. That's pretty unreal, isn't it, when you think about it that way. And he said, uh, Satan answered, then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Here's where it gets rough. You know, Satan didn't mention Job. He didn't bring his name up. He just must have said in conversation, you know, there's no one, you know, everybody on this earth, I'm, I'm going around deceiving them, tricking them. I'm going to get them all. And Job, God says, Have you tried Job? My man Job. I love that part there. And when I think about that, have you considered my servant, Job? Not this man, Job, but this person, my servant. So we know right off the bat that he serves God. So when he serves God, we know God's with him. And I know plenty of places in the Bible, he told Moses, go to Pharaoh and I'll be with you. He told, uh, in Isaiah 41, 13, he, says, he told him, he said, I am here to help you. So when you go with the Lord and brothers of the Lord, when he sent David out against Eliath, David knew God was with him, and he knew he would win the victory. So when you hear of someone that's a servant of God, you know that person knows God. And he said, there is no one on earth like him. He is blameless, upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So God went back and told him the exact same thing. He started the book off with who Job was because that's who Job is. He said, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan said, does he fear him for nothing? He said, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? So in other words, a hedge around his household means that God's, Job's, I mean, uh, Job's prayer is causing God to completely look after the whole crowd and keep them under his care. He said, you have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. Now reach, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. You know, when I see that in verse, and I, and I think about it, you know, I went back and I'm going to tell you that uh, God knows his sheep and they know his voice. And they know he's got their back. And some of my men will say, you got my back, boss? They know I do. My question is, they got mine. Do they trust him totally, unconditionally? You know, when you get into this part of the Bible where it talks about verse 12, when he told me the material things would get him, the Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. So he told him, then Satan went out from there from the presence of the Lord. So Satan left the Lord and went, and the Lord knew he was going to Job. He sent him to him. He went to get Job, and he figured if I can take everything he's got, I know he'll curse God and die. I know he will. So, does your word of possessions cause any issue between you and the Lord, you think? You think you got a little bit of faith, a little bit of uh, wants and needs in these worldly things? Do you put them ever ahead of God? Man here didn't. I think probably I do sometimes. It said one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and hit drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaean attacked the man and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. So he's found out just that quick of a second that most of his flocks were killed, his servants were killed, and his sons and daughters were killed. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. So before he even finished telling that story, another one came and told him another story. While he was still speaking, another message came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell. So in, in just 
a matter of seconds, he's heard that everything he thought, that, that, that Satan thought God, that Job cared more about than God, was gone. You know, um, Job lost all his crops, his animals, and his children in the blink of an eye. So you would think he would lose his faith. You would think he would lose the certainty that God had him because in one second he could see God didn't have him. Because he lost the things he owned and God blessed him with, he thought God didn't keep them for him. But here's where you need to grip on right here. Listen to what Job said. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshipped. Tore his clothes, shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. How much did Job think he owned? Where was Job's faith? Where do you think that he didn't know God knew what was going on? He didn't truly understand it all maybe at the moment, but he knew who was in charge and he knew who had his back and he knew that God had it under control. And that is unbelievable. He said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. I would hope that I'd come back to that realization, but I'm not certain of anything yet because I have not been through that. I hadn't even been in anything I could even mention that would even come in the ball game with this. Even my daughter's problem when she had the stroke and all, I wasn't in this ball game. But I know God's faithful. He's proven it time and time in my life. And all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. He never blamed God. Have you ever blamed God for anything? You ever wonder where he was at? Why not? Why would this happen? Why didn't this happen? You ever complain? You know, as a... Uh, in chapter 2, I'm going to go into it. Satan's going to come back. But I want to read, go back and read verse 9 and 10 again to you in this chapter before I go there. Listen to what it says in 9 and 10. Now it says, Does God, Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flock and herds are spread throughout the land. Issue in this story you need to see clearly real quick is that Satan don't know everything. God does. God said, I know my servant. I know what he can be saying. And I will not let you tempt him beyond what he can handle. Maybe we're not Job's. Maybe we're not at that point. But are you trying to get there? Or you may be wanting to be satisfied to stay where you are where you won't have to go through too much. Or you want to be where you are where maybe you won't have to suffer. You think suffering, how much greater can it be in life if you can suffer for Christ? If he knows he can trust you to go through hard things. There's some people with some terrible things going on in life that I know love the Lord. To be able to use you is the most blessed you can be by God. Satan thinks he knows. God knows. God has control of everything. He allows us to play in this game of life. He lets us make choices. He lets us truly choose our destiny. But he's always calling you and telling you, repeating time after time and showing you through everything he can, even out here in the trees, the wind, the earth, Everything showing you who he is. If you just go back in the beginning, God created. Just remember God created. He didn't just happen. God created.
Job would have traded places with any one of his children any time. Any time. He would let God take his life and take him on home to glory any second of any day to keep his kids from dying. But that wasn't the plan. The plan was letting Satan see. Letting Satan see that God, he can't get everybody. There are some people of real faith. Back I mentioned a while ago in Isaiah, I remember in 41 where he said, For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Isaiah went through some unbelievable times. And God got his attention a few times. God, I hope, is getting your attention as many times as it takes. In chapter 2, Satan comes back to God and he asks the same things. And he goes through the same thing. Job's blameless, righteous. And he said, and he still maintains his integrity. He still maintains his integrity. That's a man after God's own heart. But Satan says in verse 4, skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. So one more try. Satan says, I've done offered him everything. I done took away everything he had. I think he offered Jesus the same thing, if I remember correctly. He offered him the world and everything in it. If he ju would just curse God. Just would accept the world and everything in it. Satan just knew Joe would fall on this. And there's one thing I noticed before. I, why didn't he kill his wife? Killed all his children, all his livestock, everything. But he left his wife. But God, God said the same thing. There's no one on earth like Job. Verse 6, eight, six says, The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So you can do whatever you want, but you got to spare his life. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands. Okay, excuse me. You must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he had sat among the ashes. Woo. You know, as I read that, that just sort of uh, brings a different meaning to it when you can relate to it. I've talked to people that's been on motorcycles and had a bad wreck, and skin, so much skin off their body, people been burnt, terrible, the pain they were in. I just think about that. I'm, I've seen some people with some pretty bad things that went on in their life. But everybody wants to say, well, that's the Old Testament. That's the Old Testament, where God used to work. <clears throat> you might want to read Luke. 16, 19, story about the rich man and the poor man. It says in uh, 16, 19 to 31, it talks about a man, rich, luxury, lived in purple, lived in a big house, and out there laid by his gate was a man that laid with sores from all over his body, it said. He said he was, had so many sores so bad he took glass, it said, and would, excuse me, it said he took dogs, came and licked his sores, and that only thing that comforted him a little was the dogs licking his sores. And it says that the rich man, that the man laying at the door, the rich man never would help him, never offered him nothing, not a bit of help. Walked by him every day. Laid out there by his gate right where he had to go out. But it said the man laid there and died. He didn't die. It said he went to be with the angels. The angel took him, and he was in, by Abraham's side. And it says the, the, other, the rich man died, and he went down to hell, it says, and said that, he looked up and could see the man with all the sores standing beside Abraham, and he told him, send him down just to touch the tip of his finger on my tongue. 
Just touch my tongue. Give me a little bit of this agony I'm in. Go back and tell my bro- brothers about this. Go back and tell my, uh, all my bro- bro- family about this, my sons and all, so they won't come here to this place. He said, even if someone raises us from the dead, they won't change. You know what? I know someone that raised from the dead. His name's Jesus. And you know what? A lot of people hadn't changed. I saw a lot of them on TV last night, rioting, fighting, tearing destruction, tearing up people because of a man that got killed. I'm, that was a terrible situation. And the man that did that needs to be punished as severely as they, the law allows. And if they'll give them time, I believe that really will happen. But to tear up someone else's stuff and destruct and the police leaving their position and letting them take over police stations and all the things I see going on. And I used to think that was in other states, but it's even in Atlanta. And we know which party. You can look, clearly know who's in charge of these areas that's happening in. And you can see the difference in us and them. And I'm not talking about Republicans and non-Republicans. I'm talking about believers and non-believers. If I looked on that TV set and saw one of my kin folks and my brothers, sons or cousins, anybody kin to me that I knew there, they'd be hearing from me. But that's somebody's kids there, somebody's family, and mom and dad probably supporting them and clapping their hands for them. It's a crying shame we're going that far. It's a crying shame we done got so far away from God, we're taking everything in our own hands, feel like we own something and we owed something. I'm all about some peaceful demonstrations and people walking. I went up and walked with the 400,000 uh, up in Washington one time about for, for, for abortions, against abortions and all. It was a, just the most wonderful time I've ever had, just about with a group of people like that, the way they did everything so minor and the way it was run. Ain't the same way now. I didn't mean to get off on that, but sometimes I just get excited. So he left his wife and didn't kill her. But look what happens now. It says, after this story, Job said, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. You see why he left her now? You see why the weak vessel was left where they, Satan knew that he could use her against him? If it came down to this, he would have another pawn in his hand he could use. We clearly see that Satan controlled her. But listen to what Job said. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And all this Job did not sin in what he said. Then we're going we're gonna to really do some skipping from right here on. Uh, in the next 35 chapters, it talks about three friends and a, another young man, too, that all gave advice to Job and told Job what he needed to do and why it happened and what he'd seen and where he did this and all. It just, it just The whole thing's about them trying to help Job out. And, 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 and they were supposed to, I reckon, be godly men and giving godly advice and going to show Job, Job what he needed to do to uh, get through all this. But it didn't quite work out that way. They kept on telling him and telling him and telling him all the way up to verse 38. And in verse 38, the Lord speaks. And if you want to understand your position and see where you are in God's realm and see why God would even think about you, the little speck we are, Listen, I'm going to read to, the, to you what he told him. I'm just going to read the first 18 verses. Listen what it says. It said, Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Whew. Where were you when I laid earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand, who marked this dimension? Surely you know. Who stretched the measuring line across it? Or what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together with all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. When I fixed limits for for it and set its doors and bars in places. When I said, this far you may come and no further, here's where your proud waves will halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place 
that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the spring of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Now, you want to see it feel small. How would you like to have to answer those questions? You know, Job, it says, the greatest man of the East, without sin, sinless, faithful, a servant, upright, righteous, never lost his integrity. But what does he sound like talking to God? When I think about that, I realize how worthless I am. The only thing about me could be any good is what God I let God use. But after God got through with Job and he finally realized a little more than he already knew, You know, when I, when I think about this story and I, and, I, and I read about it, I think about it just, it just sort of blows my, me away is where these people were going to help Job. It meant well for Job, I believe. But they didn't have a clue. That'd be like me trying to help somebody sometimes when I really don't have a clue. I just feel bad and want to help them. Sometimes I might say things that I'm not sure of, not about God maybe, but just it's going to get better. If they're a believer or a non-believer, it matters. If they're a believer, it's going to get better. But if they're a non-believer, it might not get better. Just getting straightened out on this earth ain't better. Getting a new job and not knowing God ain't better. Winning the lottery and not knowing God ain't better. The only way it gets better is if you come to know God more. In verse 42, chapter 42, verse 7, it said, After the Lord had said these things to Job, Eliphaz the Temanite, he said, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So then he told them to take seven rams and told them what to sacrifice and let Job sacrifice for them and let Job pray for them. He would not let them pray for themselves. Job had to pray for them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Sometimes it's a necessity.